This is the point. It's the southernmost tip of mainland Canada, the same latitude as Northern California. It's an iconic place at Point Pelee National Park, a postage stamp sized piece of land in southwestern Ontario. While Point Pelee may be small, its reputation among bird watchers is gigantic. Point Pelee, as far as I'm concerned, is the top migration point in inland North America, bar none. Every spring and fall, the park is flooded with birders looking for a huge score. We don't even leave unless we get 200. But this birder's paradise is also a theater of life and death. Point Pelee actually has more species at risk than any other national park in Canada. Even the ecological integrity of the park itself is threatened. For the park and the animals that stop here, every day is a fight for survival. transportation corridors in North America. About four hours from Toronto and an hour from Windsor. Millions of people are right at its doorstep. It's just 15 square kilometers, the second smallest national park in Canada after tiny Georgian Bay Islands National Park. This tiny magnet has a powerful attraction. In the spring and fall, it pulls in tens of thousands of tourists. They're here because this place attracts a phenomenal number of birds. The National Park was established in 1918, precisely because it draws so many migrating birds. More than 380 species have been recorded here. It's even been declared a wetland of international significance by the United Nations. So what is it about Point Pelee that makes it such a destination for birds on the move? We're roughly 20 kilometers out into the middle of Lake Erie. Birds flying across the lake uh, or uh, migrating great distances at night, they'll find themselves over Lake Erie in the morning. And if they're over the lake, they're tired, they're hungry, they want to avoid predators. So they're, they're drawn to this, this peninsula that is a refuge for them. It's a refuge for many reasons. First, this area is such rich farmland. Virtually all of the forests have been turned into fields. So from the air, Pili stands out as an island of green. The second is because within this island is incredible diversity. There are five distinct habitats, the beach, swamp forest, dry land forest, marshland, and the cedar savanna. This gives birds a chance to pick a spot that suits them best.
perhaps no one knows more about birding at Point Pelee than Tom Hintz. Hey, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Hey, you too. This is my daughter, Zoe. Yep. Hi, Zoe. For 10 years, he was the birding expert at the park. Ah, what do you think of this birding thing? One is whether they abandon or Now he leads know, birding tours around the world, you know, including the here at Point Pelee like every spring and fall. Right. I mean, there's an issue here. Of... It's most famous for spring songbird migration during a three-week period, a very short period in the month of May. The birds that come then time their migration very specifically to arrive when they're guaranteed a meal of insects. So they... They don't get here too early because there's no bugs and they'll die because they can't adapt their, what they eat. So you've got birds like the scarlet tanager, which is glowing fire engine red and black. You've got the indigo bunting, which is absolutely gorgeous blue. You've got the prothonotary warbler, which is golden yellow, black and blue gray. That kaleidoscope of color and activity brings about 45,000 people to the park during the three-week peak. I'm just gonna grab a seat over here. To get down to the point, you have to hop on the tram. <laughs> They're being really well behaved. <laughs> right on the other side of there. That's the white crown. I haven't seen the first place the birds will land is on the point, so that's where the birders start. The best birders aren't just looking, they're listening. Around us right now I can hear wood thrush over here, orchard oriole, yellow warbler, rose-breasted grosbeak, common grackle, cardinal, Nashville warbler, so you can see quite a bit of stuff, information can be garnered from the songs around you. It's a very critical part of birding. When the sun goes down and the park gates are closed, there are still plenty of opportunities outside the park. There it is. That's good. Keep with it, it's going left. Psst. Tilt the way down. Since it's not easy to see birds, you have to rely on your hearing and knowledge of bird behavior to make a sighting. This is what's called a lek, or a loose lek, where the males agree, I guess, over time that they're going to come here year after year after decade to this one spot to display their wares to the females. And their wares they advertise with song. In the case of this bird, a little beep, followed by this beautiful aerial display up in the sky, which apparently for the females works real well. Another great catch at night is the eastern screech owl, a common resident in southern Ontario, but difficult to see. I'm constantly amazed by this bird because you can live next to them for years, never even know they're there because they look just like a piece of bark. But you can hear that they've got this beautiful vocalization and they will respond if you whistle to them. It's incredible. the birding is here, its competition is catching up. Tom Hintz travels the world birding and he sees where the park may be missing out. 
is impossible to start bird watching on this continent without knowing about Point Pelee. But as people have recognized the economic opportunities for birding, many communities and chambers of commerce have aggressively marketed their birding opportunities. And now this region really needs to do that too, because despite perceptions, the number of birders at Point Pelee has been slowly declining over the last 10 to 15 years. But a decline in population is nothing new in Point Pelee. In fact, it's a battle park management fights every day. Point Pelee National Park in Southern Ontario is a small package, but it's filled with rare gifts. Point Pelee actually has more species at risk than any other national park in Canada because of our unique location in southwestern Ontario and the very southern areas of Canada. Um, we have species that are only found much further south in the United States. Because it's surrounded by water to the south, east and west, and by farmland to the north, this is the only place in the region some of these habitats exist. Some of the species at risk are plants like the prickly pear cactus and several species of turtle. This park is so small that if we just let it run naturally the direction that it wants to go into, we're actually going to lose some habitats. We would lose the sand spit savanna in particular, so we need to be more aggressive in maintaining some habitats. The eastern fox snake is an endangered species in Canada, but even more importantly, it's a very rare species on a worldwide scale. So Ontario has 70% of the population of this species in the world. The eastern fox snake is non-venomous and extremely docile. That makes it easy for researchers to handle, which is a good thing, because they handle these snakes a lot. From the vent to the tip of the tail, 86.3. Each snake is measured and weighed. They take a blood sample to do genetic analysis. This will tell them how genetically diverse the population is, a good indicator of how big the population is and how sustainable it will be in the long term. Each snake is also fitted with a pit tag. Each pit tag has a unique identifier code on it, so it's almost like a grocery barcode. And this is uh, its essentially surgical glue, so it just seals the wound. Once it's inserted into the snake, if it's ever captured again, we can read off that code and know that it's this particular individual. That information helps track the age and health of snakes and their movement when they're released back into the wild. For decades, the focus inside the park was about making space for people. Now, it's about retooling the environment. We did a lot over the last 30, 40 years. We removed 300 plus buildings. We've removed several kilometers of road. These areas are now going back to a natural state, but we know that the job is just beginning. Part of that job is restoring habitats and bringing back species that were driven out, like the southern flying squirrel. It was an active part of the park up until about the 1920s and 30s. When there were all these cottages in the park, people were tending to clear down the dead trees, and that was homes for the squirrels. And also, a lot of people brought house cats out to the park with them. And because of that, it, the squirrel population was completely decimated. So 10 years ago, with the predatory pets removed, forested areas increased and nest boxes installed, 
99 squirrels were released into the park. We put a bait, which is a mixture of oatmeal and peanut butter, and also molasses, like we mix it, paste kind of thing, and we stick on the top. After a cold night in the trap, apples help give the squirrels a boost of hydration. There is also some cotton to keep it warm. The past years we've had up to about 800 squirrels found in the park and we figured the population is probably around the 500 range. So we're really excited about that because it's an indication that first off the forest health can support them and there have been links within the research that the squirrels themselves can help support the health of the forest. It's extremely important that parks management look for new preservation methods. Because it's not just the species in the park that are stressed. The park itself is in danger. Point Pelee National Park is 15 square kilometers of marsh, forest, beach, and savanna poking out into Lake Erie. Since it's bracketed by water, it has all the benefits that come with the shoreline. There is an abundance of wildlife in the marsh, in the swamp, and on the shore. But all that water brings another problem. The relentless pounding of the waves keeps pulling sand out into the lake. But coastal development around the park has altered the pattern of sand movement. The result is that Point Pelee loses more sand than is returned. We know this peninsula has been here about 10,000 years. It was formed by glaciers, but as this sand moves, it's, it's adapting to waves and currents, and it's actually protecting the peninsula here. As we're losing sand at the same rate, it's not coming back at the same rate. Well, that means one thing. It means erosion. Point Pelee is eroding. It's getting smaller today. It's a very difficult thing for us to explain to our visitors because the very tip of the sand's fit, which can change drastically from day to day, isn't really the main indicator of erosion. It's more the permanent areas which were once forested, which you see falling into the water. These are the sites where you can really see the change, which is really showing us that the park is indeed shrinking. As the park shrinks, the plant life drops off the edges of the park and the interior becomes exposed. But the assault doesn't just come from the lake. It comes from the north and from below. From 1948 to 1970, the farms to the north all used pesticides like DDT to control the pests. In fact, DDT was frequently used to kill bugs on the campgrounds and cottages that used to be inside the park. The bad news is that in addition to the bugs, it cuts short the lives of other types of wildlife. In the 1990s, a study of the shallow soil in the park showed that the DDT concentration in some locations is more than 300 times the recommended safe level by the Canadian Ministry of the Environment. 
it may take 700 years before the DDT dissipates to a safe level. A quarter of the park is contaminated, one twelfth at the highest level. Methods for cleaning the soil are being explored. And in the meantime, the park and everything that lives here is under constant threat. And there is a lot to lose. One of the reasons why Point Pelee is significant as a national park is that it protects one of the largest Carolinian forests in southwestern Ontario and in, well, really in Canada. You've got basswood, silver maple, the hackberries, which are throughout the park, and uh, there's also um, shagbark hickories I see nearby, and these are just some of the up to 70 species that you can find uh, in, in this habitat. If this is lost, more than just trees will be going away. There's so little natural areas beyond the point. If we lose a habitat, we're going to lose some of the species. And if they disappear from here, they're going to be lost from possibly from the, the entire country. If this continues, Eventually, the birds themselves will have no place to stop. The reason this park was established in the first place will cease to exist. That is a loss that is hard to imagine for anyone who has witnessed the spring migration. Anyone who's been here in the spring seems to come away with that sense of, this is something really special. Once you hit a good day, uh, huge numbers of birds around. You'll come back pretty much every year, week after week, hoping to get that amazing day again. And so there's much to protect. The birds are flying north, fending off bad weather, looking for food in a desperate push to mate. The fox snake is trying to hold its ground in one of the last places it can live in Canada. The flying squirrel is trying to regain a place it once lost. And the park itself is fighting for survival. An oasis of green encroached by developed land and lake. Life and death play out on a small stage, this postage stamp park, the southernmost mainland tip of Canada. Grasslands National Park sits on Canada's border between Saskatchewan and Montana. Two separate blocks, one east and one west, protect and showcase one of the largest areas of North American mixed grass prairie. This is uh, one of the most threatened systems in North America at this time. It can be an unforgiving place. Brutal winters, fickle springs, and searing hot summers. It's windier than most of the deserts in the world. Unlike many national parks, Grasslands is a patchwork of former ranch land stitched together. Large sections are still privately owned and actively worked. If the park is going to thrive, private landowners and Parks Canada must share a common vision of how this ecosystem should be managed. 
I think it would be a failure on the part of our country not to have a park like this. Since the 1800s, many of the native plants and animals have become extinct, extirpated, or endangered. We also have a, a fair number of species that are considered at risk in Canada. We have in the neighborhood of 18 species at this time. Bringing back this rare and fragile ecosystem is a monumental task. Grasslands is trying to reclaim the prairie step by step. Future success of the park hinges on it. Homesteading Act changed the open range forever. Wild land was converted into pasture. New plants were introduced. Some native species were lost. With patient perseverance, Grasslands is working to return a piece of the native prairie back to Mother Nature. But what began as lines on a map still has a long way to go. Having a park which is, when it's completed, it'll be about 950 square kilometers. I mean, at least we have that area that, that is representative of what, as best we can, is representative of what was once there. In 1981, much of the land in the proposed park boundaries was still private land. So Parks Canada approached local landowners and started developing relationships. Oh, Jeff. You good, how are you? <laughs> Long time no see. 20 years ago, it was getting to the point, it was getting tough the way things were going and then the way things have gone since, it's, it would be impossible on a ranch this size now. This was our old uh, barn site here. Oh, just starting when you get up in this ridge here. Many ranchers became willing to sell their land to Parks Canada. Local ranching was just not as profitable as it used to be. In 1984, Parks Canada began acquiring land on a willing seller, willing buyer basis, and haven't stopped since. New owners mean new management. This is a tremendously productive ecosystem. And the grasses that are on the landscape, while they you know, can be sparse because it's a very arid, dry uh, ecosystem, these plants contain really high uh, nu nutrition. To stem the tide of invasive plants and provide a more diverse ecosystem, the prairie needs to be grazed and much of the grassland that Parks bought needed another grazer to maintain its habitat. So in late 2005, on 100 square kilometers of the West Block, they reintroduced North America's largest land mammal, the Plains Bison. The number one driving force behind having bison back on this landscape, as opposed to domestic cattle, for example, was because we wanted to improve the ecological integrity of the grassland system that we're protecting here. In summer, bison will graze the long grass down to a lawn, leaving a mosaic of tall and short, soft, nutritious grass for other grazers. Blacktail prairie dogs need the shortened grass to see predators and create tunnels, which in turn are used by many other species like snakes, ground squirrels, and so on down the food chain. At their peak in the mid-1800s, estimates put the bison at 30 million strong. By 1875, 
there were barely a few hundred left. At the peak of the population, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, if you'd lined all the, all the bison in North America up nose to tail, they would have gone around the equator three and a half times. At the extent, at the end of the extermination, there weren't enough bison left in North America to go two city blocks. So we came that close to, to losing the species you know, permanently. Despite the many risks, in four short years, the grasslands herd has grown exponentially from 71 to over 200. The bison have adapted as if they never left. We now have people coming from all over the world to Grasslands National Park, specifically because of the presence of these bison. So tremendous effects on people and, and on the ecosystem. Yeah, they're a very charismatic animal. Quick adapters like the bison are surviving, but they're still closely monitored. The very culture that witnessed the new demise of the park's bison is helping to embrace the park's comeback. It was the cowboy and the culture of ranching that opened up the Wild West. And now the cowboy finds himself joining the fight to reclaim the prairie. Grasslands National Park is bringing back its rare prairie ecosystem, using hands-on techniques passed down from a disappearing culture. Cool and calm, rise into the box and been there on many, many occasions before. It's just what you do for a living when you're a cowboy. Here we go, long way to Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be in contention here. A little bit of men go to dust in our appreciation. How did you like the steer wrestler? The old cowboy ways of ranch life are fading fast and the harsh realities of the modern marketplace have forced ranchers to adapt. Along with making a living from the land, they are increasingly turning to its conservation. It's harder to make ends meet. Uh, like Jody's family had sold some land to the park. He still runs cattle, I still run cattle, we still ranch, so when we go home from our job with Parks Canada, we still have work to do at home. And Parks Canada hires local cowboys like Ryan and Jody to use horses to help service the land in the park. ATVs are not the first choice. The idea to use horses is a natural extension of ranching culture. The, the horse program that we're developing is basically a, a using our culture ties to help do our job here at Parks Canada. Horses can carry up to 200 pounds of equipment and are a great tool to help researchers get their materials further into the park with less impact on the land. Case in point, accessing a species of special concern like the highly protected black-tailed prairie dog. We're starting to use our horse program a little bit more, trying to build it, build it up a little more now. Researchers had to walk cages in, they'd put about 10, 12 on their back, and sometimes be walking six miles in 100 degree weather. So they appreciate, they appreciate us doing this. Welcome to summer in Prairie Dog Town. Population, 25,000. 95% of their species has been eradicated in North America, and grasslands is one of the few places left they can call home. What made these little guys so controversial and unwanted by ranchers is their industry. Prairie dogs chew the grass down too short for cattle to share. Their holes can also be a nuisance. So historically, for ranchers, they were seen as the competition especially when they built bustling towns. There's about 23 colonies of black-tailed prairie dogs, and the size of those colonies ranges from about 50 hectares to, to several hundred hectares on the bigger ones. In summer, the colonies provide habitat for other species, like the short-horned lizard or black widow spider. If the prairie dog goes, 
they go. Now this is uh, sort of acclimatizing the prairie dogs to this new trap. So it's, it'll be like this for five days. We won't be back for five days. Prairie dogs will get used to it. Um, and we just bait it for two days. So they then get used to it as a food source. And then uh, after that, we come back and we set the trap. There you go. Perfect. Thank you guys. The prairie dog is doing so well here, Grasslands has been studying them to see if they can handle the next important stage in their conservation. So what we're trying to determine with uh, doing work on black-tailed prairie dogs here is to see um, how that population is doing and how it may respond to the reintroduction of a, of a predator, the black-footed ferret. The black-footed ferret's main prey is the prairie dog and it was the demise of the prairie dog that led to the demise of the ferret. With the population thriving, the first black-footed ferrets were released back into the park in fall 2009. Piece by piece, Grasslands is rebuilding a patch of the northern prairie by interconnecting species one relationship at a time. There's a saying in the prairies, good fences make for good neighbors. But it wasn't always this way. Back in the old days, many species that are now endangered were being systematically eradicated. And none was more demonized than the snake. In grasslands, spring is late. Summer is short. Fall comes early, and winter is severe. All this adds up to being the northernmost limit of the rare and fearsome prairie rattler. We're here at a place called Snake Pit. Um, this is actually a snake hibernation site. It's one of the largest in Grasslands National Park, or one of the largest that we know of. And so this is a place where the snakes come in the fall to go into hibernation for the winter. The snake pit wasn't always a cratered hilltop. This has been changed by humans over um, time because snakes have been persecuted over the years, and people have come here to um, actually try and get rid of rattlesnakes and by dynamiting the snake den, actually, because um, people just, they're misunderstood. They really aren't doing anything wrong. They're an essential part of the ecosystem. Unlike larger animals, reptiles are vulnerable to subtle changes in an ecosystem and are often early indicators of water pollution, pesticides, and UV radiation. Researchers implant tracking devices to study the rattler's movements and hibernation habits. Are they the proverbial canary in a coal mine, or are they just struggling to live at the coldest limit of their range? The main problem with this snake is not actually it attacking you, um, but of you just not seeing it when you're out on a hike one day and you're actually stepping on it. Because they're very cryptic, as you can see, they blend in really well with their surroundings. So um, a lot of people will just be walking along and step on it without even knowing it. And that's when the snake's going to bite you, not just um, because the snake is mean and, and wants to get you or anything. While grassland struggles on its surface to build a sustainable and diverse ecosystem, what lies beneath, frozen in time, 
is an internationally important fossil record of the last great mass extinction of the dinosaurs. In 1874, George Dawson's survey of the 49th parallel discovered dinosaur bones in what is now grasslands. And it's become one of the world's richest spots for piecing together ancient fossil mammals. But up until 10 years ago, the land was still privately owned. Just this tract of land, this James Anderson land, is, is about two years old. So, so if you take the East Block in entirety, it, it's, 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 it's very young as well. It goes from there is such the an front ocean of, of it, bones here. The they're sticking way. out of the ground. And it's from a, it's just the back uh, third of, of a piece of, of a monosaurus. Again, so, so one of those big duckbill dinosaurs. And these, these vertebrae are, are tiny, not because it's a small animal, because this is the very tip of the tail. And so it's, 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 being, it's being preserved in articulation. So all these bones are in the place that they would have been in life. And so there's even the space where the, where the intervertebral discs used to be, like the, the, the pieces of anatomy that fall out of place in, in us, in humans. Poaching fossils from the park is highly illegal and carries a stiff penalty. There's plastic here. And this plastic was not laid down by us, nor was it laid down by anybody uh, collecting prior to us uh, with a permit. And so this means that there's poachers in the region. Paleontologists like Hans must go through a stringent permitting process to access the park. Who's you guys get? Oh, there's a Chevron. Completely, really worn. It's broken, uh, but I mean, by having the, the facets like so, so sort of dis dislocated, then, then it's more the neck, like base of the neck. Um, there's a Champtosaur rib with a double facet there. That black line right there is the KT boundary, and that's the boundary that's exactly 66.07 million years old, and that's exactly the time when we stopped finding dinosaurs in the fossil record. And that's the time when we have about 75% of all life on the planet gone. We can look laterally and find it on all the hilltops close to here. So it's a great marker because now we can, we can sit anywhere in the park and look up the hill, find the KT boundary, which is a globally deposited piece of rock and just measure up to it. And so every single fossil that, that we find here is then recorded to the meter or, or to, to, to the 10 centimeters resolution uh, from the KT boundary. Using GPS, they measure and synchronize thousands of fossil localities to the KT boundary, building a compelling a, like picture a of an important park. event yeah. in the so history of the, life on the Earth. Is a black map. We have currently about 325 fossil localities in a nine square kilometer region for the east block of Grasslands National Park. And this, uh, this site now makes it 326. Finding fossil beds is just one part of the equation. High erosion rates here can wash away a site before archaeologists get a chance to excavate. There hasn't been a whole scale uh, uh, collections activity going on in this park ever. And what, what we're trying to do is collect hundreds of sites and, and record what's going on and uh, fully collect microsites, fully collect bone beds, really get a, a big picture of what's going on. And because it's a national park, anything that's collected is under permit, and all those pieces are given numbers that we can use in our database. And here we go. Let's back up here. Grasslands works closely with museums and universities at home and around the world to help piece together the extinction of these massive ancient beasts. Basically everything on the table here is uh, Tyrannosaurus rex. And uh, this, of course, is uh, Scotty, the one that was found here in the East End area. It's the most complete T-Rex in, uh, in Canada. Though not recovered from within park boundaries, Scotty is a prime example of the area's rich fossil beds. This is the last large block from the T-Rex quarry. It's in a really cemented sandstone. Got some neck vertebrae here, 
And so some of the back vertebrae, we get into the hip here. In the last 20 years alone, scientists have almost doubled the amount of known dinosaur species, and Grassland's relatively untouched boneyard might yield a whole new picture of the mysterious life of these fascinating creatures. From the ground up, Grasslands is reclaiming and rebuilding its once vast and powerful ecosystem. Consulting neighbors and stakeholders, that takes time. We, we want to make sure we do a proper job of it so it benefits the, the most people um, and, and still remain within Parks Canada's mandate. Yeah, yeah we're, we're right at the very beginning and, and, and uh, we're, we're getting off to a good start. And even though large parts have only been parkland for 10 years, grasslands is proving the success of one species is always linked to the success of another. It's helped our town out a lot. Our town's small and parks came in. Um, there's been employment. There's been a lot of outside people come in and start to call Valmarie home. So it's, it's helped keep us a community too. Their success will bootstrap an entire ecosystem from the brink of extinction, transforming the land and its diverse community back to its original glory.